All right. You're listening to 88.1 and we're doing a live interview. And um, I'm Kiowa Cat with this, this is Essence of the Tribes. And we're gonna talk today with uh, Stephen Lewis Simpson. Uh, he is bringing to St. Louis a film, Neither Wolf Nor Dog. Uh, it's a Roaring Fires film. And uh, I'm just excited to, you know, bring this here and talk to you about this uh, film that you had uh, made. And um, so with that, you know, I'm going to go ahead and just let you, um, you know, start with a general maybe overview of this film for our audience uh, listeners uh, on what, you know, what, what you're bringing here to, uh, to us as an American Indian uh, culture. Uh, thing. Neither Wolf Nor Dog uh, is adapted from a very popular novel that came out in the mid-90s, and it revolves around an elder uh, called Dan, uh, who was played by Dave Bald Eagle, who was a Lakota elder, who was 95 years old when we filmed. And he was really, you know, the heart and soul of the film. And the story follows his character, um, who reaches out to this white author who, uh, and it's Kind of based on the author's um, some of his real experiences that the real author Kent Nurburn had done this project on the Red Lake Reservation uh, where he had worked with youth and took them out to meet elders and help the youth distill the elders stories down into a book and um, and it got quite well known in the area at the time and so through that he got to know certain elders and this one in particular wanted him to do something expanded with him and so his challenge was how to make all of these incredible things that he had been told sort of just how to distill it down into a way that would work for a reader so he created this construction of a of a road trip um where his character gets sort of sucked into this road trip and also experiences a lot firsthand with the elder and so the movie sort of follows that journey and uh the elders uh, best friend is a guy called Grover who's played by Richard Ray Whitman who's you know an amazing artist as well as actor and um, it's really about opening the, the, the writer's eyes to uh, a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at the world. And, um, and in a sense, the film had to reflect that as well. Um, one of the things that I had to set out within it is to create a film that, you know, the elders kind of teaching about how to be comfortable in silence and to be comfortable within yourself and not just have to talk your way out of a box all the time. And the film sort of does the same. There's a lot of detail in the space within the film and it sort of tries to calm you down into a space where you start looking and hearing things in a different way. Um, so the, the film sort of reflects the elders approach with that. And uh, we filmed it on uh, mostly on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and it was my uh, third feature there. Uh, I made a, a love story thriller there called Resbomb uh, a few years before, as well as a feature documentary, A Thunder Being Nation, that I had uh, made over 13 years and that stemmed out of the first trip I made out there, uh, which was in the summer of uh, 1999. There was a, a ghost shirt which had been taken from the Wounded Knee Massacre site that had been sitting in a Scottish Museum ever since and I'm Scottish and uh, when I heard that was happening I knew I had to to head out there for the repatriation um, and I went out there a bit early and um, within three hours of hitting Pine Ridge I'd been shown around Wounded Knee by a local and then he directed me to Camp Justice this protest camp on the the border um, with uh, Nebraska and White Clay, Nebraska. It was for a couple of murders that had happened and weren't being properly investigated. And then I followed some folks up to Russell Means's house and Russell asked me to film three days of political meetings that were happening there. And that was my first three hours uh, in Indian country. And that filming for Russell then spiraled into meeting other people there who asked me to film other things. and. Uh, would take me to elders and film and so on and that spiraled into a thunder being nation and that was sort of the interesting thing when I was looking at neither wolf nor dog and the author approached me with it uh, he stumbled on a showing of my movie Razbomb that I was doing beside the reservation 
and gave me the, the novel afterwards. And the thing that was very easy for me to understand was how somebody could, you know, a, a lot of people would look at it and say, what, you got a call out of nowhere. You drove to meet this old guy. This old guy right. told you some stories and then suddenly you're committing to writing a whole 400 page book. Yeah, come on. And yet for me, it wasn't, you know, sitting for a few months writing a book. It was a 13 year journey doing this documentary. And then the promise to make this movie became another 10 year journey. Um, so, so making that sort of level of commitment was very easy to understand for me. Right. So why did this particular book grab your interest? Well, that aspect I could relate to it, but the, the other aspect about it was um, I have a, you know, we get taught things like, you know, wounded knee as a history thing. And it's, you know, yes, it happened in the past, but it is still present. Okay. And it's still present within the elders. It's still present within, it was present very much within Dave. It's present in so many other echoes. Um, and so to deal with something contemporary that really explored that to me was powerful. And, uh, but then... I couldn't have imagined where we would have gone with that because we ended up taking that further than I'd ever sort of expected. Right. And uh, I noticed that with Hollywood stereotyping, you know, that strikes close to home to me um, only, you know, because, you know, I, I uh, you know, with arts and crafts, it's, it's a big thing. And um, with all this American Indian films um, being made uh, by non-natives, what makes this film any different? Well, I, I think the funny thing is that there's actually not many made full stop when you really think about it. I mean, you get the odd movie that's, um, you know, some period thing. Um, but whether you look at what Hollywood's output is versus things that are being produced by native filmmakers, it's when you consider, you know, 5,000 feature length films a year in the US, and most of them are tiny little indie movies that nobody sees. But even when you count it all up, well, you know, if you're talking about 1.6% of the population, you know, you should be talking about 60, 70 movies on that theme. Right. Um, not two. So it's very limited in whichever direction you go. Um, and the, one of the sad parts is there are, you know, some, you know, good native filmmakers out there whose films aren't being seen, and that's exactly the same bracket as neither wolf nor dog um, or, you know, a number of other works. The difference is that I'm kind of a bit crazy and will, I'm prepared to spend four years distributing a film uh, to hundreds of theaters and putting it in, you know, and just kind of. Right. And that brings me to it. another question about mm -hmm. you as, um, as a director, you know, born in Scotland and, you know, and because, you know, uh, you know, your, your background at 18, you were a stockbroker and a trader. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you come over, you know, and into the film industry. And, yeah. you know, that that's interesting because that's a far, you know, kind of thing reach, you know, uh, you're not living in the backyards of the, you know, reservations or that, you know, yeah. um, and your interest in, you know, and all that, you know, yeah. so. Well, well, actually, and, and to bring that back to your previous question, because the I didn't really get to into depth with it because I think it's very important. Um, I think one of the things that is, is essential for, I, I think most filmmakers, when they step in Indian country, they miss their first job, which is every character is an individual. And that sort of goes out the window when it comes into Indian country. It's, it's a freaky thing. And it was sort of, I remember, you know, Russell talk, Russell Means talking to me about it when, because we became very close friends and, and he would say, you know, he'd be on set and there'd be a director having these conversations with the actors, the white actors about what they were going to do. And then he would turn around and tell the natives what to do. It was a different discourse. And that is, you know, I think the key starting point where all of those types of films are doomed to begin with. Um, one of the things that sort of distinguishes the work that I've done from the get-go is um, 
you know, and this is what I do with all my work. It doesn't matter, you know, my next film I'm shooting in Bulgaria and, you know, the lead is based on, you know, a friend of mine who used to be a, is a Bulgarian international terrorism analyst. And her character is, you know, it's so infused by this person that I know. Um, and it's the same with neither wolf nor dog. It's drawing on just so many individuals, you know, I'm, I'm drawing on Kent Nurburn, who I spent time with and took on the journey and really got a handle on his character through that. You know, with Dan, it was, it, it would take an insane person not to have just Dave just purely take that on. Uh, similar with Richard and, you know, Zahn McLaren and, and Tatanka Means and the amazing Roseanne, Roseanne Supernault. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that is funny about it is that generally the, the, the flack that I sometimes get for being a non-native step, stepping into this territory uh, is, is pretty much always from non-native critics who are kind of like being all woke about it. And like I was listening to one British guy and a Canadian guy the other day, and they were sort of talking about how... Um, you know, the film didn't have, you know, it wasn't sort of, it didn't sort of jump into sort of cinematic drama, especially at the sort of wounded knee scene. It was like, they were expecting me to dramatize things. And I'm like, that would be so offensive to this pristine primal place that we went to with Dave. And that would, and that, and what they're saying is, you know, they're having an issue with the white guy telling a native film but not doing it in a white enough way, because that's the odd thing about the way they're sort of going about it. And the way I sum it up best is the thing I'm most proud of with this film, out, of, out with the viewpoints of a handful of important people to me, is when I have uh, particularly Lakota people or Ojibwe people or those that are closest to the narrative. Uh, they say, one thing I never hear, and this makes me very happy, is oh, you, you really captured the Lakota people in this film. I'm so thrilled I never hear that because then I'd be failing because then I'd be doing something generic. What right. they do say is, you know, Dan reminded me of this grandpa I knew when I was young or Richard reminded me of this uncle or, or Roseanne of this auntie or Zan's character or this guy I knew. It's always individual. Right. And when I uh, got to see the trailer on it, I, you know, was even enthralled with you know Dave and his performance because you know as a Kiowa woman uh growing up you know with the culture you know he captured you know that every elder story that you know you hear you know on every um tribal reservation you know throughout mm -hmm. uh throughout Indian country you know mm -hmm. um and that was neat to see that you know, that you were able to um, bring that, you know, and... I mean, my, my, well, my biggest role with that was creating the environment to bring out what the, the most he could give. And, it, you know, in my, my documentary, uh, there was no voiceover. There wasn't a single, you know, other than a couple of little cards placing it within time. There wasn't a single voice or narrative element in the entire documentary that wasn't um, from someone within the reservation. My job was to, you know, really as an editor in terms of how to shape the 80 hours they gave me into 80 minutes. Um, and then before I finished it, I went back out there and I did something that most documentary filmmakers would say is insane, is I had no one sign a release form before the interview. I had them sign it after they saw the documentary and because I didn't want to put a single thing in that they felt was ended up structured out of context because you edit different pieces together. And, um, you know, the only thing I took out was, was somebody's story, which was a little self grandizing of themselves. And then somebody else who was there in the era was saying, you know, actually, this is how it went down. And I'm right. like, okay, you know, I'll pull that little bit out. But, um, but we also had something with this film that is, I think, really unique. And the, the climax takes place at Wounded Knee. And the character 
Dan um, is from a bit further north in North Dakota, but still Lakota. But um, Dave was Mini Conju from Cheyenne River. Uh, he was of the people that fled down to Wundanee and were massacred there. So he was closer to the, the, the events through his family than the character he was playing. And so, and the whole time I'm filming, I was never comfortable with what was on the, the page for the climax. It had the wrong focus. It was much more about Nurburn's absorbing everything and letting it in. Um, and so we got to filming a final scene we filmed with Dave and probably the final scene because I just didn't know what I was going to do with it. And I was worried I had no film because without a climactic sequence, uh, there is nothing. So I lined up the camera on Dave and initially we did a couple of takes and a couple of little bits and he was getting very kind of historical and kind of contextualizing it. And we were sort of going, this isn't really going to go where it needs to go. And then we went into a closer angle and then he just went really deep. And it was an unbelievably emotional and at the end of filming it, he turned to Christopher Sweeney and said, I've been holding that in for 95 years. Wow. And there's a, so there's this extraordinary thing that happens in this film. You know, fiction films have a great power in the sense that you create a character the audience really connects with, falls in love with, and you go on a journey with them. And you can, you know, it can be very emotional or all those other things. Uh, documentary have a completely different power, the power of reality, the power of the theme and all these things. And in this film, we sort of, towards the climax, we slip through fiction with this character that, I mean, uh, you know, it's very easy to love this character as much as any you've seen on screen because, right. you know, it's Dave. And he was that and more. Um, but we slip through that and it's like even slipping beyond documentary because what we are filming is a time and place of this man. And he had the most extraordinary life of, you know, most unbelievable things from being left for dead on D-Day to a lot of other unbelievable things. Right. I was going to ask you to embellish on his, um, yeah. you know, and the other actors that bring all yeah, this together. But, but just to, to finish on this point, I, I know that to Dave, looking back on his all, you know, extraordinary number of significant things in his life, I do generally, genuinely believe that this was a significant moment for him. And the fact that he has now touched, you know, well over 100,000 viewers on the big screen after he's gone with this it, to me is, I mean, it's the main reason I, I chug on forward with this, continue right. to get it further and further out there. Right. Um, if you can, and you know, I mean, he is, he was a, um, a great man that from what I've read, you know, with, you know, him going, you know, um, uh, and his wife, you know, losing his wife and then going and, and getting into the, you know, movie world and all that, you know, that's a, that's a, it, to come from a reservation, that's a, you know, big, uh, big deal, you know, mm -hmm. to get out of there and get into the mainstream, you know. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the other, you know, actor and actress, uh, you know, that um, also helped this film out? Um, you know, I was reading a little bit about them and that, you know, it really, I'm really yeah. excited because, you know, these are people that, you know, I grew up with, you know, that I've yeah, seen, yeah, you know, yeah. and heard about, you know. Well, if I, if I go through their sort of scheme, the amount of time on screen, because um, obviously we also have Christopher Sweeney, who's playing Nurburn, and, and there's right. a couple of funny things about him. Uh, I could have auditioned thousands of guys to be the mid 40s, all American white guy in the movie. He's the only person I auditioned. And I saw him in the Native Voices at the Autry program, which is of na Native playwrights at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles, great program. And there was a play, and he was, I think, the only non-Native actor on stage, maybe, give or take. And there was just something about him that resonated, and um, we kept in touch, and I cast him, and it, it all worked out very, very well. But there's an other, another funny little coincidence. He's, he's never really had, you know, it's not like he's had a relationship with Indian country in general, apart from this, and... 
the fact that he was born in an IHS hospital right. on, the, on the Yakima Nation in Washington. <laughs> so, you know, right. yeah, I mean, what's the odds of that? White, yeah, only white guy I know ever born in an IHS hospital. So that was kind of funny. Um, and then Richard Ray Whitman, um, he came to work every day like it was the most important thing he'd ever done. And I think that that's a gift that he gives everything he takes on that he believes in. Um, it's a great gift he gave to me, but I know he gives that gift to all his other collaborators. And when you're making a film as fast as I did with a tiny budget and no crew and you're in the middle of nowhere, the whole time you're going, you feel like you're going to be found out at any moment. And, you, and, and, you know, actors can really give you grief if they kind of like, what am I here doing here? What's right. going on? The, they were all so on board. Um, it was, and, and Richard, every time I looked at him, it was just always a case of, I'm really happy to be here and I got your back. And I just, I mean, I love them all. I mean, it, he's just, Right. And that, that, and that could voice. That, <laughs> could that be, you know, because um, they want that story out too, as well as Dave did, you know, they, uh, they want uh, to be heard, you know, I have a question yeah. for you here. And, mm -hmm. you know, while you were at Wounded Knee with Dave Bald Eagle, and the living history, you know, that he brings along with him, uh, Richard uh, Whitman, uh, knowing that he participated in the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973, what was it like filming them with them? And did their connection to the area affect that particular scene? Well, I mean, I think Richard, I mean, he's from Oklahoma, but to him, Pine Ridge is his sort of second spiritual home. Right, yes. And, and from 73 on, he goes back a lot and he has really deep relationships there and um so and for me it, it's somewhere that has always been the anchor of everything that i've i've done from when i went, went out there in 99 and um yeah there's just you know, <laughs> there's nowhere like it it's um but also you know to tonka means uh you right know, his, his dad had a little bit to do with 73 um and you know tatanka i mean he drove that morning from doing a gig in uh eastern nebraska drove all the way there with his wife and and daughter spent the day filming and then drove all the way back to new mexico later you know had it started heading that way and he donated his performance to the film he was like i i was like okay you know and your you know your travel and all this and he's like because you know i mean i'd known him for for years and uh right. and from in some very special um circumstance and you know he, i i loved his dad and and there's there's a lot you can say about his dad but tatanka's just oh he's right. a sweetheart he, he, he's right. he's just awesome and um but also within the cast the first person i auditioned and it was quite a while you know, it was like I think three years before I filmed because I was in Canada searching for before I met Dave um, I was searching around all old actors I was up in Canada meeting Jimmy Herman and things like that and this um, agent said you got to meet Roseanne Supernault and she just on Blackstone the, the series up there and I, it wasn't really in my mind at that time and he insisted and he insisted so she was the first person I had read for it and I had to read these two granddaughters um in their early 20s they sort of took different directions in life and she was really terrific and so i said to myself okay i'll audition other people and whoever feels like the best option for one or the other roseanne will be the other because she can do them both brilliantly and i never found anyone i felt as comfortable with as her in either of them so i, I spoke to kent the author and i said what about them being twins? And he said, uh, he said, well, actually, that would make more sense in a way to, because of what he wanted to do. He wanted to basically show, you know, the daughter who stayed on the res, looking after grandpa and all that sort of thing. And then the other one who went off to, you know, like a rapid city type place and, you know, with her husband and kids and whatever. Um, 
and just subtle differences really um and he said yeah it works great so and you know i love it when sometimes people watch the movie and then they say i was watching the credits that was the same person in person yeah. um yeah and then you know zon mclarnan who is the hardest working actor i know um i met him a good few years ago and then i included him as the get one of the guests i did this tv show um eight nine years ago called the hub which was the first original program for fnx first nations experience tv ch uh, show a uh, channel and um it came about in part because i was away to do this long road trip to pine ridge to take my documentary out there and show it to people and um they just started up and i wanted to see a show that felt like the indian country that i have had the great luck of experiencing and by that i mean the most incredible people and i'm you know i'm very lucky i mean it's like when i think of pine ridge for example you know i think of a friend who won indian market the other year i think a friend who you know is an executive in hollywood i think another guy who's flying around doing incredible business deals and i think of the only person i ever have known with a gold medal from the olympics you know i don't think of you know just you know there's a lot of incredible people and i have more fun on pine ridge than anywhere nowhere else on earth i laugh more so i want to create a show that highlighted all these amazing people and i flew down martin sensmeyer who hadn't really done anything at that point but since was one of the leads in the magnificent seven is playing jim thorpe in this movie that angelina jolie is one of the producers of um he's done a lot of big things since then and we drove around the country and i had him meeting amazing people you know thosh collins uh virgil ortiz zahn was in it adam beach you know it was, it was um uh, Georgina Lightning, Michelle Thrush, da, 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 da. it was an amazing lineup and it's fun and it's really fun. So I got to know Zahn through that and I, I, I went and videoed him going to a, an audition class that he went to and I tell you this guy turns up to a class for an audition better than most actors turn up to do a big scene in a big movie. He's the most professional guy and the most hardworking and I mean my god the guy's got so many extraordinary credits and is working constantly and more deserved than any other actor I know. So anyway, I, I could talk a lot about how much I admire Zan. I talk a lot, I know. Well, that's all right. I do too. And if you, if you let me, you know, I, but I, I'm, I'm doing pretty good right now. So <laughs> anyway, you know, I kind of, um, you know, understand, you know, about how it, you, you came about about making this movie or this film uh, not wanting to, you know, go with ho Hollywood stereotyping, uh, moving the location, you know, to where, you know, it doesn't even look like the place, you know, you're, you need to be, well, for us Indians anyway, non-natives wouldn't understand, they would just believe, you know, that's where we came from or something, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Navajo re Reservation, you know, their scenery and all that is just, you know, and that's more where the movies are, you know, uh, produced at and stuff. But, um, you know, so um, do you feel making uh, neither wolf nor dog uh, will help bring awareness to the struggles of all American Indians uh, lives across America, you know, past and present? Well, I, I think that's, you know, a lot to kind of place on the shoulders of anything, really. I, th I think that for me, what the, the success of the film is, Dave, when, when the audience falls madly in love with Dave, they listen with their hearts as well as their heads. And I think that what they feel through this story, if they're smart enough, they realize that this story is echoed throughout North and South America, America and, in, yeah. and other parts of the world. Um, and... And that's the thing about narrowing it down into something so personal as this one elder. Right. Um, rather than turning around and saying this is being this sort of, you know, big outward thing. Um, there's a, so, you know, I think what it does is allow people to empathize in a different way. And I, and I think it's hugely important. I think that when we think about, you know, you imagine a hundred years ago, um, people would have struggled to even realize that 
you know, 90 miles down the road, and certainly somewhere like in the UK, people might have a very different accent because right. they didn't hear it because our reference points in the world were very narrow. And then, you know, things started to come out and you would start seeing movies from different parts of the world and you would start to relate to things differently. And, you know, when I grew up, I loved Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. So I watched Hong Kong constantly in movies. Uh, whereas my father's generation, Hong Kong would have seemed very distant. And so I think there's, there's this great seed planting of all communication where we're just creating all these bridges and there's some of them are smaller or some of them are bigger. Um, but there's another thing which is also important in the film, which I think a lot of people miss out on. And, and some people, when they're also saying, why you to make this film versus anyone else? Well, the primary thing was I actually got it made and a lot of people, not some native and non-native tried. And so it, sometimes it's just a case of who's crazy enough to push something across the line. Um, you know, sometimes people imagine like Hollywood, there's sort of a committee that says who makes the decisions, but it's really quite random. Um, but the key perspective here is it's not just on, you know, a white guy with native characters. It's also the Nurburn character. And, and for me, the most important perspective I brought to the film was I could really see how awkward he was. And a lot of it is how awkward white Americans are in Indian country. And right. the funny thing is I've, I've just spoken to so many Europeans about this who go to Indian country. They have so many great friends. They're crashing in their homes. They just have a blast. And then they invite them over and da, da, da. And there's this exchange. And it's always fueled with laughter. And, you know, because probably we're coming over, we, we're not filled with all this internal dialogue of history and whatever else, but also we're in travel mode. And when we're in travel mode, you walk into a place with a big goofy smile on your face. And, you know, and the thing about Lakota country is uh, surprisingly, I think, you do not get judged as much as a lot of people might think based on, or I haven't for sure, in terms of you know, the color of your skin, because I see so clearly the distinction between people who go in there, like some of these Europeans, just making friends. And people are so open to openness, but also close to closeness. There's really a, a kind of mirroring there. And, I, and so that's why, I, there, I've, you know, in my life, I've lost more people that I've loved outside my immediate family in Lakota country than all the rest combined. Um, and it's been through those sort of, you know, relationships. And the key for me was I went on the road trip with Real Kent Nurburn from his home in Bemidji, and we parted company actually at Wounded Knee. Um, so it's a full arc of where the narrative took place. And I took him to meet this elder on Cheyenne River, uh, this guy called Harry Charger, he was an extraordinary guy. I hadn't seen him in many years. He had no reason to remember me. Uh, and I called him up, and I hadn't said a word yet. And he's like, FBI or CIA? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm like, neither. I'm a movie producer. And he just cracked up. And I said, can I come on over? Sure. I went over and we took Kent with me. And we are sitting there. And within moments, me and this old timer, I mean, he's just one of the most fun people you could meet. And we're just batting forth one liners and we're just having a blast with each other. And Kent's sitting there the whole time being very kind of trying to be as culturally considerate as possible. He's like, well, I'm here with an elder. And this guy's, you know, was a highly regarded elder. But it's like, to me, anyone in life who's really got a great understanding of anything, you know, like a Bishop Desmond Tutu or somebody, uh, is somebody with a great sense of humor. Right. Because if, right. You're, if you're wise, you should know how to laugh. Right. Yeah. I mean, laughter, I know in my tribe, that's, uh, you know, universal for us, you know, it, that's what breaks the ice. That's what, you know, just, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. You know, mm -hmm. I have a question though about the audience that you're bringing this to in St. Louis. You're going to be in mm -hmm. Chesterfield at the yeah. um, Marcus, what, yeah. uh, Marcus uh, yeah. Theater. Uh, yeah. You know, so St. Louis doesn't have a lot of American Indians and um, mm -hmm. tribal members, you know, living here. Uh, I was graced by, you know, just, you know, I'm, I'm tribally enrolled uh, with the Kiowas and I'm an artist and, blah, you know, but I live here in St. Louis. So how do you, because people on my radio station say, well, what, what's that dance, uh, song, you know, what, 
because they they're I'm not saying that they, you know, are uneducated, but they, they don't know, you know, um, the, uh, what did I put here? I said, what would you say to non-natives going to see this film for the first time who may have limited contact with tribes and the tribal culture and the, and the tribal people? Uh, you know, how do you, um, you know, what would you say to them? What are they going to be watching, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the film's played in, you know, a few hundred theaters and, you know, a lot of them very close to Indian, a lot of key parts of Indian country, a lot of tribally owned theaters, which was really very important right. for me. Um, but in a lot of other communities. And and so, you know, um, like, for example, Jefferson City in Missouri, we had a phenomenal turnout. Um, but I think one of the reasons, I mean, it draws a large older audience. Um, and I think part of it is it's, for a lot of people, it's like a, a almost like a good old school movie in the sense that it's a, a movie that'll make you laugh and cry and really make you feel like you've been on a great journey with extraordinary characters. Um, it's not a, um, you know, it, it's it's very much a kind of film with feeling, um, not a, it's not, you know, it's nothing sort of art house about it that, that, that sort of right. can some, sometimes keep, keep create barriers. Um, with audiences because they're trying to be too clever or cerebral or whatever. This is very much about a pure character core. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, that's the thing. It's like people have a very emotional journey and I guarantee that whether they love or hate the film, they will never forget Dave Bald Eagle. And that's, yeah, that's the best part of it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate, you know, you bringing this to St. Louis and, um, you know, sharing your film with us. And um, I wanted to ask about the financial part of it, though. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a struggle for you. How many crew members did you have, you know, working on this? I mean, it wasn't a big movie production, but mm -hmm. you're bringing it to the big screen, you know, so. Yeah, that's the thing. We, we've, and the other thing about it is, you know, normally, normally theatrical releases for small films lose a lot of money and then they try to make it back um from tv and dvd and things like that but they're released by you know companies that have big deals and whatever mm -hmm. else um in our case it's just i don't have that power to be on those other platforms and they don't buy direct from producers so cinemas is where this lives so we just kind of managed to, to chug along with it and it, it kind of you know it keeps itself moving along i mean at the moment we're we're opening on more theaters on friday than any other point before but you know, you have an average of four people per showing in the United States for, you know, averaging out all movies right now. Um, and that's one thing if people worried about, you know, obviously sensibly worried about social distancing. Um, if you're going to be in any kind of public space, which is the central call, um, cinemas are actually probably the most socially distanced public spaces as you're going to find because right. if you're there with your partner, there's maybe one other couple in the entire cinema and obviously they're big open spaces. Um, with a you know fluid ventilation so you know compared to a post office or a diner or whatever else it's um it you know it's a far less risky environment but you know it's still a public space um but yeah my average crew was two um and for out out with the shooting it was only myself all the way through the first few months of distribution it's been almost 10 years of my life and um, probably about 25,000 hours added up because, you know, some of it, it's just full on. Right. It's kind of crazy. Well, I really appreciate it, Stephen, with talking with you. Um, well, thank you. You know, I, um, we really appreciate you bringing this to St. Louis uh, and sharing with and calling KDHX, you know, to get your word out, mm -hmm. you know, and I want to help you get the word out about this movie um, it, because it's close to home to me, you know, it, yeah, it, yeah. I think every elder needs to be heard in some way. And this is very, you know, it's a big thing for us, you know, yeah, to uh, yeah. see this on the screen, you know, preserving and, our and, and these guys and, and also, I mean, there's, there's another, there's, there's this lady I, I've, I've met before, uh, Marcella Lebeau, Marcella Lebeau, who's up on Shine River, who's the same age as Dave, she's still around, but I think she's about the only one left of that era from that area. I mean, it's remarkable just to have been able to capture on screen.
Okay. Well, what are the and, and, screening dates again, and the and the you know where and how can people yeah. get? You know, yeah, it's the Marcus in Chesterfield, and it's from uh, Friday the 30th, and it will be there for at least two weeks. Um, they're not screening every day, so check this, the, the theater for times. I think it's maybe Friday, Saturday, and Tuesday or something at the moment, because, you know, they're, they're obviously doing a bit limited hours at the moment. So, but yeah, it, it should be there for at least two weeks. Okay, is there any last words you would like to, you know, give us or, you know, um, share well, with the, us? It, we we've just had a great community connection with it word of mouth has been the key so if you know anyone that's of interest that would interest please spread the word um, people can connect with us on our facebook page neither wolf nor dog movie let us know what they think and there's elements there that they can share um the reason that you know most small films never get seen or heard is that it just costs a fortune to do marketing on a national level that's why I've done it four years marketing it around the country because I can just through t effort market a few theaters at a time. Uh, I don't have to spend money to do that. It just, it's a lot of work. Um, but without word of mouth, and that's true for any, all native content, whether it's, you know, uh, a great singer or whatever else, it's like, it's a, the, com the community passing things on to other people is, is so key for it to continue to grow. And the more cinemas, I mean, uh, 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 Indian Horse, I think it was called a Canadian film, did very well up there and was released in cinemas in the U.S. And they sort of mapped, our, their booker said they mapped our release uh, because they could see where our film performed well and they could go to those theaters and those theaters took the film because they went, oh, we did well here with another, uh, you know, genuine native themed film. And they were open to it. And so people turning out and supporting it opens the door for the next one, whether it's, you know, Stephen Paul Judd or Sterling Harjo or Georgina Lightning or um, all, so, you know, that's it. That's why I greatly appreciate you taking the time to chat to me and, and, you know, I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you and thank you for, you know, doing what you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, thank you.